this is Connor from, and he is the head of cryptographic engineering at Lightning Labs. Uh, today he's going to talk about the architecture of LND watchtowers, which is super cool. Um, Connor actually was one of the first people who helped me uh, set up my LND node and to see my <laughs> node on the on the Explorer. So uh, that's pretty cool. Oh man, we've come a long ways. <laughs> totally, totally. Awesome. Yeah, well, you know, thank you uh, everyone who's here attending and thank you to uh, Patrick and Andrew for setting all this up. Um, pretty excited today to speak on the, the topic of watchtowers. It's something that we uh, at Lightning Labs have been working on um, for almost a year now from sort of like conceptual, like, um, like proof of concept code to like really like fleshing it out into like what would be today more of like a full-on protocol. Um, and hopefully today, well, we're going to summarize sort of like a year's research into uh, this sort of 50 minute presentation. And I'm looking forward to getting into it with you guys. So we'll dive right in. Hmm. Let me, let me start my, uh, my talk from the beginning. All right. Can everyone see this? Cool. I'm assuming you guys can. All right, so we're gonna talk about today about the architecture of L&D watchtowers. Um, so before, there we go, let me figure out how to do this. Um, cool, so some background first, uh, before we jump straight into like defining like what the watchtower problem is and sort of more generally how they work, uh, we're gonna first do a little bit of background on like sort of the primitive components that we're working with here. And the first one is commitment outputs. So when you open a channel, there's a funding output on chain that has a certain capacity. Let's say it has 70K sats in it. Um, uh, at the same time, when you create the channel, they, you create two transactions uh, that spend from it, and they'll have asymmetric balances, as you'll see. So at any given state n, my commitment balance might look like this. The green represents my balance, uh, a 50K Satoshi's. Uh, that's locked with a pay to witness script hash output. And the remote parties, funds are locked with a pay to witness key hash output and that has uh, the remaining balance of 20k sets, ignoring all the fees here. Um, similarly, their commitment transaction will be like a mirror image of it. And then notice like the commitment output types are flipped. So um, where on my commitment, I have a P to SH, they have a pay to witness key hash with my 50k sats and vice versa. They have a pay to witness, pay to witness script hash with 20k sats that has their remote balance. Um, so they're kind of mirror images of each other and the contracts are flipped because from my perspective, uh, from either party's perspective, like the, the big P2SH one is the one sending money to them and the pay to witness KF one is the one sending money to the other person. Now, so what is a breach? A breach is when after we've agreed on some state M, the remote party, it's always from the perspective of the remote of, of me, the remote party broadcasts a state that is less than N. Um, these have been revoked and we've given up a commitment secret that allows the other person to spend them. So the reasons they might do this is they might have more funds in that state. Maybe they're actually trying to maliciously cheat you or that there is possibly like an implementation error in one of your, uh, the clients or maybe just a user error. We've seen a couple um, people like restore from old backups and uh, most of the cases I'd say so far have been user error uh, that we've seen in the wild. I don't think we've seen anyone actually intentionally breach people, but you can't really tell. So. Um, now, let's say their equipment state I has a lot more balance in their output. Um, that's the P2SH output with 60K. So they're trying to sweep this maliciously and take, um, take more balance for themselves because in, the, in state N, I had say 50K sats. Um, what you, what LND would normally do or any of the implementations currently out there uh, is in the, when they see this transaction broadcast on chain, they'll recognize that it's a revoked state and they will immediately try to spend all the outputs back into their own wallet. Um, the biggest issue here is that their two local output, the blue one here, is locked with a CSV. It's not a standard like uh, it's not a standard pay to witness key hash script or pay to pay to public key. Uh, and there's a time lock on it. And after the time lock expires, uh, that person is able to also spend it back to their wallet. So there's this window of uh, contention where you have the ability to rectify a, a breach. And after that period, the remote party can also take their funds. So that's the critical window that we have to deal with. Um, it's not necessarily critical that you sweep the two remote output. It is a pay to public key hash that you have the secret keys to um, for the most part. So uh, that's not as sensitive or as like time sensitive as a two local output. But 
we uh, in the LND watch tower implementation, we also sweep it for you just because in the case of data loss or something, you might not be able to. So we um, we sweep both of these outputs back to your wallet like automatically. Now, the problem here is that like your node has to be online and operational to be able to respond to breaches in this manner. Um, LND has a subsystem called the breach arbiter, which basically monitors for these on chain and then we'll take all the outputs that are on that transaction and try to spend them back into your wallet. Um, if you're not online, then you can have a situation where you just miss the breach entirely and then the remote party is able to spend the CSV outputs uh, back to their wallet. So when can these assumptions fail? Well, you can have a node failure, DB corruption. Um, we've seen some DB corruption in the wild. And so if you have that, then your channels could be vulnerable for that period of time. You could forget to pay your AWS bill or you delete your entire data dirt. Um, specifically on mobile, there are some extra concerns that come into mind. Um, primarily one is like your phone might run out of battery. You go on a hike for a weekend and you don't have internet access uh, or like you just forget to open the app for a couple of weeks and you miss the breach because the app was never aware of the thing that happened on chain. So, and the reason I bring mobile in uh, specifically separate from in general is because all of these problems that exist, um, you know, the, the, the cases on the left can happen to any lightning node and watchtowers will help check against that. But on mobile, the issues become sort of like even more complex because of sort of this like intermittent starting and stopping of the app and just like um, like limited reliability and like intermittent connectivity. So the, the watchtowers really come into play to support mobile in a lot of ways. They definitely do help the, the other case, but mobile is where they're most critical, I would say, um, just because of this sort of like infrequent use. Um, and so they basically offer you a safe way to actually run a mobile phone and maybe not be online for a while and still have some insurance on your channel. So the solution that watchtowers provide is you're going to delegate a highly available party to detect these breaches and respond to them on your behalf. Um, the name watchtower obviously comes from like some medieval thing where some guy sat up in a tower and watched for like the approaching enemy and then would like ring the town hall bell or something like that. But um, in this case, uh, they're broadcasting a Bitcoin transaction when they see when they see the enemy. So some constraints on like what what our final approach needs to be. We don't want the watchtower to have signing keys from the client, uh, particularly the keys that spend those outputs from from the prior slides. The, the watchtower should not be able to just willy nilly send those funds anywhere it wants. Um, that's important for sort of like maintaining the, trust, the trustlessness of the towers um, and making sure that the client never, that the, the keys never leave the client phone. Um, there can also be no interaction with the client. So like once I send you like the info you need, I should never have to interact with you after that point. If the tower had to ask while the breach is happening, that kind of defeats the whole point because we're assuming there's sort of like this um, intermittent connectivity assumption. Um, and then I think the real, the real, the real tricky trade-offs um, come into when you consider privacy and also to maintain like this quote unquote sufficient level of privacy. Um, there are, when you think about it, like a, the requirement of a watchtower is when you revoke a state, you back something up to this other server more or less, um, is inherently sort of like a timing side channel. And that's not a timing side channel in like the cryptographic sense, more of just like a financial uh, timing channel. So if someone knows that it's you backing up that state, they can see that, oh, Connor made a transaction at 11.35 on Saturday. Um, and so all of those trade-offs like really come into mind. And like basically if you're gonna have a service that does this, we want to ensure like the utmost privacy uh, or ensure that we can provide the utmost privacy for clients um, in a way that sort of protects their anonymity and their privacy from like the services that um, are providing like a tower service. So, and that, and that's not, that's, sorry, that includes um, not leaking the channels that the client owns and particularly like, or hopefully obfuscating like the client identity. Um, you want to mitigate the sort of like timing side channel, like I was saying earlier on like your actual payments and financial privacy. Uh, there's also the question of when you sweep on chain, how do we make sure that we maintain a good practice of not doing address reuse um, and making sure that when we give the tower the ability to sweep funds to a particular address that we don't give up privacy um, either like if towers collude um, or just by nature, like I said, of like spending to the same address twice. Um, and finally, there's a couple of things where you want to provide like network level anonymization, anonymization. <laughs> Uh, like Tor support. Um, so the current watchtower protocol in LND is like abstracted to the sense where you could drop in a TCP connection um, or a Tor connection and everything should work the same. 
Uh, and so this brings us to this question. And I think the design space of this problem is, is really, really massive, I think. Um, there are a number of different directions you could take this, um, given how much you weight the constraints or concerns for uh, not giving up keys, like uh, privacy on various metrics. There's probably like 10 or 12 different like dimensions of privacy that you want to be aware of, at least, and then can make specific trade-offs. And we have, the implementation we have tries to make the best of all those. So um, now, when you want to like spend someone else's UTXOs but don't have the keys, uh, there are a couple things that you're going to need. Um, pr uh, predominantly, you need to know the inputs being swept. Uh, in in those first couple slides, we're going to be sweeping the two local and two remote outputs of the remote parties to the transaction. Um, when you think of like, I need to fill out this transaction to get it to broadcast. First, you have to know which inputs are being spent. Like, where am I? Where is the money coming from? I then have to be able to know the witness script for each of those inputs because. Uh, because they're both segwit, those inputs will have a hash in their uh, UTXOs that is the hash of sort of the script that is going to be redeemed. So I need to be able to reconstruct that to satisfy the hash um, so that it, I can even execute the program. Then I'll need to know the outputs on that. So uh, the destination and amount um, of, of the input funds minus fees, where does that money get split up and how is it divided? And finally, I need to actually provide a valid witness. So uh, I have the script and now I actually provide a signature and possibly pub keys that would satisfy the script and allow the funds to be spent. And if you have all those things, uh, at least in the context of the watchtowers here, you'll be able to broadcast the transaction and it should be confirmed and sweep the funds back to um, the intended target. So uh, we're gonna talk about the two local output a little bit more just because it's slightly more complex than the two remote, which is a pay to public key or uh, pay, to public key, pay to witness public key hash. Um, the two local script looks like this. It's a simple if statement and you have a revocation pub key in the first clause and the second clause is uh, a delayed output sending money back to the other party. Um, the way you spend this in the revocation path is you provide at the top of the stack, which is actually kind of the bottom in this diagram, uh, the two local script itself and then the op one allows it to take the first branch and finally, the revocation signature validates under the revocation pub key. The items in green here are information that the tower cannot know on its own. Uh, the pub keys here used are random uh, 33, by, 33 by values, more or less. The two self delays, um, like a, typically like a UN32. So it's going to have a tough time like knowing these values on its own. So the client has to be able to provide these to the tower in the space efficient way such that when it needs to sweep, it can fill in this sort of template and spend the, uh, the two local output. Um, I think it's gonna, we're gonna take a quick detour into some of the watch, uh, Watchtower code itself. So this is the justice kit, which uh, we'll get to later on, but forms the basis of the payload that goes into an encrypted blob. Um, you'll see here the first, these uh, three, the revocation pub key, local delay pub key, and the CSV delay. These are those three parameters that were in the two local script that need to be plugged in so that you can have the valid witness script. Um, you provide a signature under the revocation pub key um, that allows you to construct a valid witness. And then you similarly for the remote outputs, you have sort of the pub key, which is more or less the script in a pay to witness pub key hash. And finally, a signature under that. So these things allow you to reconstruct the witnesses uh, and the witness scripts that, that, that like spend the remote parties uh, commitment transaction. Uh, I'll get to the sweep address in a minute, but note that the sweep address that you want your funds to go back to is also included in this paper. All right. Uh, so now, now we'll go into uh, session policies. So it's clear that, well, it's clear, it should be clear now that like I need to update or send information to the tower that I need to store in sort of this time locked manner. I want to send this to the tower and then at some point later in the future, when it sees the remote party's commitment transaction on chain, it will need to uh, reconstruct that transaction from the information that I've given it prior. Uh, and on that slide where we listed out the four things that you need to be able to spend the transaction, we've hit most of them, but uh, the one thing we haven't really covered yet is the output values. Um, and so for the most part, that is dictated by what's called a session policy. The session policy specifies these five fields at the moment, it can be extended. Um, but the most critical ones here are the last three, the sweet free rate, the reward base, and the reward rate. Um, so let's see. 
what, the, what this does is it fixes a function of sort of like the commitment transaction that got broadcast and allows you to compute the output values. So most importantly, for example, the sweep fee rate, uh, what a, you add up the balance of like the two local and or the two remote output and you take, you subtract out the, like the sweep fee rate from that. And that gives you like sort of a remaining balance, depending or not on whether the, uh, the justice transaction has a reward, uh, which can be toggled via a bit in this blob type. Uh, the reward will also be subtracted out and this uses like a, um, you know, a base fee. So you can say like, I want 10,000 sats plus 1%. Uh, so you get like full MX plus B control over the reward output. Um, it also reduces the amount of per update storage. So if uh, this, this sort of like function more or less needs to be computed for, uh, for every transaction that, uh, that, could, that could happen. So by defining a session, uh, by, by including those uh, parameters in the session, I don't have to send this sweet theory reward base and reward rate, reward rate with every, uh, with sort of every backup that I send. Um, I should note that basically a session, it encompasses a, uh, an array of, an array of like slots more or less. So I will request from the tower, uh, let's say a thousand slots and they will all have this fixed sort of fee rate, reward base, reward rate. Uh, and then I can send at some point later up to a thousand updates to it and sort of like, and the tower will honor that request. That's sort of the promise it's making. Um, like I said, these are proposed by the client. The tower can accept them or reject them if it doesn't want like the terms. Uh, the blob type is used for a couple things, but um, it's also included so that we can enable future modifications to the base protocol without having to rewrite everything from scratch. Um, and so that they can, so that we can interoperate if we um, continue to improve the protocol in any way. And the main thing here is that this is channel agnostic. Um, and this, this is really important from a privacy perspective. So nothing in this policy, for example, says that I'm sweeping Connor's uh, channel in block 5,000, 5, 5, I don't know, 560K. Um, what happens is I, send, I can send any, uh, because it's a function more or less of the transaction that's broadcast, uh, I can send updates for any channel to this policy. So if I have five channels, they can all use the same session and the tower doesn't necessarily know that um, when I send it updates, am I sending it all as one channel or am I sending it as five? Am I using mostly one channel or maybe the other? Um, and so because of that, you actually increase the level of privacy because the, the, towers, uh, the tower is constrained in sort of like what it learns from a timing perspective to this sort of aggregate sum of um, all the channels you put into that session or all the updates you put into that session versus just knowing that, um, Oh, this update is for this channel and, he, and you know, I can see exactly more or less like when this channel was used and whatnot. So this is like a, this is like a, uh, there's been some discussion about this on the mailing list and you know, it was just, it was sort of inferred pretty early on that like this was like a sort of better approach from a privacy perspective. So we sort of bit the bullet and decided like we were going to go for it. And I'm, we're, I think I'm pretty happy with how this, with how this like turned out, uh, in terms of like an efficiency perspective. So, um, Oh, for what it's worth, I didn't mention on the prior slide when we were talking about the justice kit, but the payload, um, the payload itself is 274 bytes to sweep this. So that's basically the, the plain text payload fits in the tweets that I use to like talk to you guys every day. Um, when you add encryption and stuff like that, you get to around 316 bytes. Um, so the, these, these, the sort of blobs that you're sending to this tower are very small. And, and on top of that, the tower is storing just these sort of session parameters that you see here. Um, so we'll dive quickly into the policy. Uh, and this is like pretty important, I think, to understand from the perspective of how the policy fixes the function um, that dictates how the outputs look like. So the policy has a primary function called compute justice TX outs. Um, and predominantly it takes a total amount and the weight of the transaction, of the justice transaction so far. Um, and the blob type has a bit in it that signals whether the transaction should have a reward or not. Again, this is like agreed to by the tower up front. If it does, it will go ahead and compute the reward outputs, which makes two outputs, excuse me, um, one with, with a sweep amount going back to the client and a reward going to the tower. If it's an altruist sort of uh, justice transaction where the tower is basically saying, I don't want a reward, I'm just gonna give you your money back minus fees. Uh, then there's a separate function that basically takes out the, the fees and computes a single output that sends it back. Um, the, up here, there's more, you know, there's more logic about computing the exact uh, fee rate and sweep amounts 
Again, these are like the session parameters that are saved up front and negotiated by the client and tower. Um, and then here's sort of like where the proportional and base fees are subtracted uh, or computed really. Um, so uh, hopefully that gives you some, some insight into how the session actually creates this function that determines the output values. And we can sort of like use it to um, use that as a sort of generalized mechanism for uh, describing justice transactions across like channels with varying capacities and such. So, okay, moving on. So I think some of you have probably heard uh, earlier about the term encrypted blobs and um, there have sort of been a number of variations on this idea and um, and you know well there's been a lot of like design over this over the years too but this is more or less how the derivation will work for the tower that we're going to or for the, sort of the protocol that we're going to propose. Um, you start with the breach ID of the transaction that um, of the of the breaching transaction. Remember that these are all known up front because I've already like negotiated in, in the channel. I will have negotiated the state with the remote party. Uh, once they revoke it, I know the breach TX ID. So at that point in time, I have what I need to be able to um, do this derivation and encrypt this backup to that tower. Um, the hint will be, so it's broken up into two parts, mainly a hint and a key. Uh, the hint serves as a sort of um, short identifier for just knowing that a breach happened and detecting that um, a breach that happened and was confirmed in a block is something that I, as a tower, have in my database for one of my clients. Uh, and this is done by simply hashing um, the breach ID with some like four byte magic and taking the first 16 bytes. Um, the second is uh, the natural encryption key, which is done in a similar fashion, but it's actually a 32 byte value. Um, now these are put together and you, we use cha, -Cha 20 poly uh, 1305X, the, note the X, which is, uh, uses a slightly bigger key and non-space. Um, and so when you put these together, you have a 16 byte hint along with this 314 byte payload, uh, encrypted payload. Um, and then, uh, the or ciphertext. The payload here is then the serialized version of that justice kit that we saw earlier. Um, so all in all, this amounts to 333 bytes uh, when all is said and done. So for a thousand state updates, you're talking 330 kilobytes, which really isn't that bad considering that like every time you upload an image to Instagram, it's probably four to eight, maybe. I don't know. Um, so, so yeah, the, the, the amount of space required to sweep the commitment outputs with this design is actually pretty small. Um, and keep in mind also that um, I think the prevailing use for watchtowers will often be for mobile clients. And so like mobile clients will probably be making far fewer transactions than your average routing node. Um, so like, like in addition to being like somewhat efficient from a space perspective, there's also the, the, like the realization that mobile phones will be like offline and perhaps use less. And so they'll also consume less, uh, less space from the towers that host them. Um, moving on to like a simplified version of like the wire protocol and how this works. So we have a tower and we have our smartphone that's running lightning. Um, this is actually what my phone looks like if you guys are curious. Um, and the first thing that's gonna happen is the client will generate a session private key and a session public key. Um, when this is done in, in, in NLB's watchtower design, this is done by uh, deriving a key from your wallet secret. So it'll have a, you know, it'll have like a derivation path that you can use. So that way you don't have to store the actual session key on disk. You can derive it when every time your node starts up from your seed. Um, now the session key is used to authenticate. Um, it's sort of like your, your login, really. The, the public key acts as the, ter the tower's way to identify you and the session key allows you to log in. Uh, all communication between the client and, or between the client and the tower is done via uh, bolt eight, um, which is the same protocol that is used uh, in the lightning network to, uh, when two nodes like have a channel and operate, do gossip, all those things uh, run over bolt eight, which is Brontide. Um, it's like a package in LND, that's what we call it. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Brontide is like the low thundering sound that lightning makes in the distance and uh, props to Lolly for, for that name. I think it's pretty cool. So, um, so moving on, so the client will basically, all, like I said, all communications are done using this private key uh, or this key pair. So when I want to, sign up for a session, I send it over like more or less the policy that I want to use for that. Um, this, if the tower accepts, it'll save those parameters under my session public key, allowing me to log in at any point after and continue to update that session. Uh, the tower can reply with either an accept or a reject. 
Um, if there's a reward output, the tower will also return sort of the reward address that should be used when constructing the justice transaction. Uh, and after that step is sort of uh, initialized, I can send any number of state updates up to the max updates. So if I requested a thousand sort of slots, I will be able to send over a thousand updates and this, the tower will basically act those every single time. Um, and so that more or less, um, again, the state update, uh, if that wasn't clear, is where all the encrypted payloads are, the, the hint and the encrypted blob. Um, you kind of send both as a pair and each sequence number is like allocated linearly up until like the max updates is reached. Um, so to dig a little bit more about how the insides of a tower work, um, let's see, the towers, towers are actually really simple, I think, from a conceptual point. Um, and, I, I, and from an implementation point, not too bad. Most of the work is actually in the client. Um, but so the tower, at least in L and D right now, um, the tower package has what's called a standalone tower. Uh, and that couples these services together. So one, the pr one primary service is called the server, which is responsible for talking to outside um, to clients. And you also have the lookout, which is responsible for um, actually doing the, like detecting breaches and then responding to them. So the server it, uh, has an exposed port. You, uh, the clients can reach it via the same way that you would paste in like a lightning pub key at IP or Tor address or whatever. Um, and so the client connects in and is able to do what we saw before. It's able to create sessions. It's able to update state. Uh, the lookout uh, subsystem is talking to the Bitcoin network. It's listening for new blocks. And every time a new block is received, it, it looks through um, this really fancy thing called the database that is like a shared communication mechanism between the, the lookout and the server. Um, so as the clients send in state updates, those get written to the database. The lookout is then receiving new blocks, and when it's uh, when it gets a new block, it applies that hint transformation to all the TX IDs in the block, and then queries the database to see if we have any matches. If they do, the uh, the matches are retrieved, then they are decrypted by applying that key transformation uh, to to the breach TX ID, and then decrypting the payload. From that, it's able to extract all the um, components to fill out the witness script. Uh, the witness, like the witness arguments, you know, the like signatures, stuff like that. Um, and then it uses like when this, when the match is created, it returns also the session parameters that are used uh, for that update. And that allows you to take the sort of like two local or two remote output values in the breach transaction, sum their, sum their total value, and then run it through that function that generates the uh, either the altruist or the reward outputs. Um, and then assuming all that is good, uh, you should be able to take that transaction and the watchtower should be able to validate it. It should be able to see that like the witness, uh, you know, the scripts are correct, that the, the signatures are valid. And, and if all, of a, if all that checks out, then the watchtower just publishes that transaction to the network and the user's funds should be swept to um, either themselves or split between it and the client. So that's sort of like a high level of how the, the watchtower works. And there's like a good level of optimization. I think when you get to like scale, that can happen on this front. Um, that I think are pretty exciting, but we won't go into detail here. Uh, so moving on to like more of how the client itself works, this is something that will live inside LND. So uh, LND will have this sort of like separate thing running off to the side that is responsible for managing like watchtower sessions and backing up states. Um, it should be pretty lightweight, and there's some other. Um, I'll get to that later. So uh, the client has sort of three main components. Uh, the dispatcher, which is sort of like the central unit of like allocating uh, backup tasks to specific towers. Uh, let's say that you the tower already has like a session it's negotiated, or the client already has a session that it's negotiated with a tower. Uh, when that happens, there's this um, internal queue really that's that is a spawn that basically is responsible for accepting new things that need to be sent, encrypting them, and sending them to the tower. So. The dispatcher will know how full the queue is, and it can say like add five, and the queue will take each of those, encrypt them, and send them over to the tower. So as channels are revoking states, they are all calling into the client to say like I need to state back them. Those get funneled into the dispatcher, to which the dispatcher like looks, okay, I have an available session queue. I will schedule each of these, um, and they will be subsequently forwarded to the tower. Um, now the question comes in, like what happens when that when that session runs out? Uh, when that session is exhausted, uh, as so we call it, um, we use what's called a session negotiator. And the session negotiator is responsible for doing that first part of the wire protocol where I send create session and I get a reply. So the session negotiator can pick from 
uh, any number of towers. And it will basically manage the dispatcher requesting more uh, slots and it will contact, um, it'll maybe like round robin them or something and try to get a new one. And once that's fulfilled and we've received like an okay from the tower, it will hand that off to the dispatcher to allow it to continue processing more updates. Note that you can have more than one session queue at any given time. Um, if I have three sessions like open with three different towers, the dispatcher can kind of like rotate them, um, rotate across them like a distributor cap. Um, this can be useful for privacy because um, let's say I only do one session at a time. If I only do one session at a time at the same tower, then it doesn't give me that much privacy, right? I can see that this one is exhausted and then immediately after I'll have to request a new one. So if, if the tower is like watching, you can see like, okay, these, these ones didn't overlap and this one like ended and started pretty close. I could probably like do some like correlation there. Um, so what you can do here is you can uh, pick like any number of towers to actually have sessions with and you can like rotate between them so that no one tower is seeing like your exact um, financial sort of transaction history. Um, on top of that, you can also um, have multiple sessions with the same tower. All that requires is generating a new session private key. So I can even, um, let's say this one gets half, half emptied. I can request a new one that partially overlaps with it. And then I can like sh uh, shuffle between those two. So that can kind of also help to like uh, delineate sort of like the history. So it's it, because like I said, these uh, the session queues are like really, or the sessions themselves really are channel agnostic. You're pretty free to like rotate um, your usage of the towers. And there are like probably a lot of heuristics you could use to do so. At the moment, L&D will just do like, um, uh, you know, exhaust one, request another, um, just for like simplicity. But it's, uh, most of the logic is actually there to handle like rotation and stuff. But just to get like an initial implementation out, we've decided to um, just go with that. But it probably wouldn't be too much longer before uh, like sort of more active like heuristics like that and stuff. Um, awesome. And then I think we'll go into like some future improvements for the Watchtower protocol. Um, this is just like an abbreviated list. There are many more, uh, but some of the ones that I find pretty interesting. So one of them is sweeping HTLC outputs. Um, sweeping HTLC outputs is non-trivial. Uh, I could probably do another whole talk just on that alone. Uh, and for many, many reasons, which I won't get into here today, but just know that they are very hard and that uh, there are some things we can do to actually do them sort of efficiently, but I think the trade-offs there are less clear. And so it would probably be more of a discussion for the wider like lightning community. Um, so another thing that we haven't implemented yet, but will probably have to be implemented like fairly soon is the concept of a session payment. So when I request uh, to the tower, I want to create a session, it will like either accept or reject. And if it accepts, it will first require like a small payment, maybe like a hundred sats to basically just as basically like a DOS prevention thing. Um, so I will pay a hundred sats. And then if the payment goes through, then I'll get my new session and I'll be able to continue updating. Um, you might be wondering, okay, well, how do I make a payment before I actually, or how do I make a payment if I'm, if, and I can't back up the channel yet, right? Um, so interestingly enough, if, if you're able to make a channel that's worth backing up, AKA a single funded by me, um, you really can't be breached because the remote party doesn't have any funds in it. So there's sort of this bootstrapping phase where like, uh, I can use sort of my initial balance that is, isn't really at risk to pay for the session, at which point I now have channel insurance, and then I can continue to update it as the balances shift. So in case you're curious about that. Um, another one is incentivized garbage collection. So with the, with the session-based approach, whenever, uh, well, let's say with this, with the channel, if you were to have like say one session per channel, uh, the session could be sort of cleaned up by the client whenever that particular channel closes. Um, with the session-based approach, it's a little more complicated because um, you don't want to close the session or like remove the session from the tower until every channel that has been ever used in that session has actually closed out on chain. Um, so that's good and bad. I mean, you get the privacy, but you also um, sort of like you might have to hold some things around longer than you than you need to. But um, I don't think that's like that's not a huge concern of mine. But what is uh, a bigger concern is just making sure that people are incentivized to actually clean up state when it becomes uh, when it becomes time. Uh, and one way you can do that. Um, is sort of by like when my session is exhausted, let's say, or maybe when it's created, I get a token from the tower, uh, like specifically like a blinded token. I guess it doesn't really have to be. Um, I get a token from the tower that I can broadcast at a later time and basically say like clean this up. And in doing so, it will sort of like 
maybe give me a deduction or like a, a discount on opening another session. Uh, and so if I can prove that I deleted, then I actually get like this uh, discount on future sessions. Um, another one which isn't implemented uh, today, but like could be implemented, um, probably not, it wouldn't be too hard to implement, let's say, is this SHA chain based session attestation. So right now, when uh, I send updates to the tower, I sort of just use a, I use a sequence number. Um, the sequence number just says, hey, uh, I'd like to put something in slot one, and the tower will say, okay, yeah, you're good. Um, like, here's an act for that. Continue on. Let's say I have some data loss, and the tower wants to, and then I come back online, and the tower wants to say that, oh, you, um, let's say I've only used 10, but the tower says you've used 500. Um, that would be an issue because, like, let's say I actually paid for this, right? Uh, and I'm now, the tower is unwilling to say that, I don't get those uh, slots between 10 and 500. It's now saying that you only have 500 to 1,000 now. Uh, and so like that, I mean, you know, that could be an issue. I don't foresee it being an issue just because of like how the trust relationship between the client and the tower will be, but it's possible. But one thing you can do to prevent that from a cryptographic level is to actually use SHA chain, which is the same protocol that's actually used for revocation uh, within like the lightning protocol. So what this allows you to do is is every time I want to back up a state, uh, each state number has this sort of secret I can send. And if I send that to the tower, um, if, I, if I lose data and connect later, uh, they will only be able to give me sort of like, they'll, they'll be able to prove that I've sent up to a certain number, but they won't be able to prove any farther than that. Um, and that can be useful just for like knowing that like, they can lie and go backwards, but at that point it's like, okay, you're giving me more space than I asked for. Um, but this could help help prevent cases where like the tower tries to cheat people out of like the slots they pay for. Um, blinded renewals, so sort of related to the garbage collection, but um, more or less like if I want to renew and I already have a session, if I had a blinded token that would do that, um, that would allow me to sort of like roll over subscriptions um, in a way that the tower that can't really correlate the two, but still get discounts, for example. Um, and this really comes into, I think, is really interesting when you have this concept of like whitelisting. So let's say I run a tower, I want it to be open, uh, like public facing, so it's got an open port to the internet, but I don't want just anyone to be able to uh, store their data there. What you can do is you can have a sort of whitelist where I say like, this is the first key I'm going to use with the tower, uh, and I give the tower that key. Uh, you're allowed to use the session as much as you want. When you get to like, so when that session is exhausted, let's say, then I use this blinded renewal technique to get a new session uh, or somehow like pre-authenticate the next key I want to use. And so now uh, clients are able to like effectively renew with the tower and continue to make new sessions um, on the premise that they had some initial like whitelist that got them in. Um, and so I think that's really interesting because you can sort of use that to control access um, in a way without basically like opening like your tower up to the world. And it also like allows you to have some level of privacy because I can use sort of sessions and if, you know, if, se if the sessions are relatively small, let's say, then, you know, after a couple number of like rotations and like what and renewals, then like maybe the correlation between two like users is less clear. So I think that's a really interesting one and probably one that um, is useful in the context of private towers, maybe run by individuals or even companies where like, let's say, um, let's say you have an app and you want to back up to a tower if the app somehow like whitelists you first, and then after that point, it needs no more like authentication or like co or coordination to be able to like have you renew in a way that is secure from the tower's perspective and yours. Um, I think that, I think it's really useful and something that would um, we should definitely continue like research on. Uh, another one is uh, batch windowing. At the moment, the protocol like L and D will sort of send like one state update, wait for an act, and then send another one, wait for an act. Um, you can put those in a stream so it's that like it's I, I connect once and I send you 10, but you have this explicit like send act, send act, send act. Uh, batch windowing would allow you to basically say like send 10 at a time, then receive 10 acts. Um, and most of the logic is actually there to like the, to handle this, it's just not implemented. But the protocol in terms of like how it's, uh, in terms of the parameters and like on the server and client are both there and like fully will support it. Um, that's useful if like you're, you, um, let's say I have a really old channel that has a million state updates and I want to back it up really fast to a tower, uh, I can use this to basically get more performance out of that. And so like when moving to a situation where you, uh, you didn't have a tower before and now you need to do this like a historical backup of all your channel states, this will allow that to be a little bit faster. 
Um, and yeah, if you're interested in learning a little more, um, the source code is available. Um, a lot of this tower design is actually emerging to L&D. There are a couple of open PRs and maybe some that aren't even up yet that will really be up before the final stuff is done. Um, and you, you know, join our community Slack. Uh, we'll probably be discussing this a bit on the mailing list as we move more towards uh, potentially formalizing this into a bolt. And then uh, you can find me on Twitter. I'm Vic Connor. And then uh, Lightning is obviously Lightning Labs, uh, the company I work for. So thanks. Yo, that was fantastic. I've been waiting. You know, people have been talking about watchtowers <laughs> forever. And so it's so great to get, like, here's straight from the source, like, in depth, what, um, how it's going to work and all that stuff. Oh, man, um, I looked a little bit over, didn't I? <laughs> No? Oh no! Uh, we oh, no, we're good. Yeah, time. yeah, yeah. Cool. We have like uh, twenty minutes, so which is great for Q and A. Would you mind um, stopping the screen share so that we can have something a little bit more interactive? There sure. it is, perfect. All right. First question is: Will the slides be available after the talk? Absolutely. Yeah, I can. Uh, I'll, I will share them and make them public. Perfect. And uh, yeah, maybe I'll post them. Uh, we're going to host these videos afterwards too. And then um, maybe I can include it in, in the description below. Uh, if you guys have more questions, please feel free to use the Q&A button or type your questions in the chat and I'll try to get through it, all right? All right, Connor, are you ready for this? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, here we go. Um, will it be a simple process to using multiple of your own or trusted devices, like a cell phone, desktop, tablet, friends known or whatever, as watchtowers for more private communications or is this being thought of as an important part of the design? Um, he says, I know that would be my first assumption for using a watchtower sending sessions to my smartphone. Lastly, is that dangerous if it's not a full known or is Nuccino enough? That's a lot. <laughs> um, it, so I think if maybe I misunderstood, but I think the bulk of the question was, can you share sessions sort of between like all my devices? Um, and in theory, you can. Uh, it's probably like easier just to like make separate ones perhaps and um, like use different keys just so that any state doesn't get mangled when you're using different devices. But in theory, you could. Um, hopefully, hopefully that answers the question that's actually the question that was being asked. <laughs> um, and then I, oh, there was also the question of like, is Neutrino enough? And I assume yeah. um, that means on the tower side where you're actually like listening to the Bitcoin P2P networking, fetching blocks and um, scanning. Yes, you, Neutrino is enough. Um, all you need to do is like fetch blocks and Neutrino can do that. Neutrino just listens for a new header. Uh, and every time that happens, uh, it'll just fetch the block from the P2P network. So that is enough to implement a tower and do the scanning. Yes. Okay, so here's a little bit uh, more sillier question. Uh, Justin Moon wants to know, how much do you deadlift? <laughs> uh, it's been a while since I've deadlifted, um, but I don't know. Probably last time I deadlifted was maybe 360. <laughs> what? Yo, that's legit. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Here's another question. Uh, will it be easy to observe which channels are using watchtower services on chain? Uh, would there be any way to mitigate this via sweeping addresses being used with some of your 2P ECDSA work? Um, that's a good question. So, I think the, the biggest the biggest hint that you're using a tower would be like traffic analysis, probably. You'll be able to see like uh, state updates going to a tower. Um, at the end of the day, they are like sort of this fixed size blob. So on one hand, they do kind of get themselves that way, but they also don't like leak anything about like um, how many outputs like the commitment transaction has, stuff like that. Um, and then I think the second question was about uh, privacy and related to 2PCSA. Um, in theory, yes, you could, I mean, you can use 2PS, 2P ECSA there. I think the biggest win there would be uh, space efficiency. You're kind of already giving up that this is a tower, that this is a channel. Like one, once uh, like a state is broadcast unilaterally, you kind of expose them to the world that this is a channel, more or less, uh, just because of the scripts being used. Um, so I don't know if it'd be a huge privacy gain there, but I think you would definitely gain something. Um, maybe you wouldn't know, because, yeah. Um, so there, yeah, there are, there are probably places where you could use that to gain a space, a space efficiency. Okay, uh, next question is, it's a pretty basic one. He says, can we choose our watchtowers? And if so, how? Uh, yes, you'll be able to choose them. Um, the current uh, way it's implemented in L&D is you just give it a address or like a, a pub key at address and it'll try to communicate with that tower. Um, there's some, it's, it shouldn't be too much of a stretch. 
Uh, like I said, a lot of this logic is there and generalized in a way that's like should be easy to extend it um, to like offer a lot of features. Uh, at the moment, it only supports like backing up to one tower. But um, one of the things that we're hoping to get in before launching is actually support for multiple towers. So I'll be able to oh, say wow. like, um, so I'll be able to say like, use one of these three, and it will sort of like rotate between them uh, and do that. Um, uh, sort of like side note to that is. Uh, I want to use these three and back up to all of them, not just one, right? Or I want to back, basically what you're saying there is I have, uh, I have a particular state and I want to back it up to three towers um, and make sure, you know, make sure that happens. So you, then you can get even more creative and you can say like, I want to use these 10 towers and I want to make sure that all of my states are backed up to at least three of them. Because um, at the end of the day, the, the Watchtower game is really a game of like one event security. Only one of them has to be the, be the job. And so like, uh, being able to have like like redundant backups of your of these states is important, uh, and then obviously for the privacy you can like rotate and stuff like that. So um, that yeah, that is that is coming. Cool, I like that. The Watchtower game is uh, one event uh, <laughs> or whatever you said. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, this is from the next question is from my man Patrick Walters. He is also a co organizer of the Boltathon. Do you foresee watchtowers being something that smaller or more local communities would set up to protect each other or larger or for larger centralized services? Um, I can see both really. Uh, I, I think there is a future where you have both. And I think the, the reason like any particular person would choose to have one just depends on the set of trade-offs that they are willing to make. Um, if you are, if you really want like more privacy and you think that your small group is going to provide that, excuse me, um, then by all means, like, I'm sure they're going to happen. like, I'm sure that'll happen. Like, I will probably have one that I offer out to my friends, for example, uh, if you're in the club, no, I'm kidding. Whoa. <laughs> um, but like, you know, but at the same time, you would, you could also see like a company offering this as a service. Um, and one of the main things that like you have to be aware of when choosing a tower is that they need to be very reliable. Um, you know, so that what, I mean, when it, what it comes down to is, do you trust like your small group to actually be more reliable than a company that actually has like, you know, many AWS servers running this, for example. Um, and that's, you know, I don't think any one person can answer that. It depends on your technical competence and things like that. Um, but, you know, there is a trade out there too, because you can also use both theoretically if you, um, uh, if you want. And I think the, the bigger thing for us is that like, um, and I think a lot of the thinking that I think a lot of the thinking, I think uh, a lot of like the, the thinking and sort of design that went into the protocol itself was say like, okay, let's say there's a worst case scenario where like everyone uses one centralized service. How much privacy could we offer from this protocol in that case and start from there? It's like basically assume they could have almost perfect knowledge. Like how much can we strip away in terms of like what they can learn? Um, so because like, for example, if, um, you know, if some company does decide to run one, uh, our job as like in designing this protocol is to make sure that they can learn as little about their clients as possible. So, um, it, there are a lot of there, honestly, there are a lot of shortcuts you could take to get a watchtower service up that sort of sacrifices all those things. Um, and in my opinion, it'd be a shame if that was then the sort of uh, protocol that was relied on as a centralized service. Um, mm. if you had a protocol that just gets adopted maybe because it's like simpler to implement, um, but that also like takes away all the privacy, um, from their users, I think that would be like a really sad thing to see. So um, we really tried to like make sure that that was going to be mitigated to like the greatest extent possible, knowing that people were going to make these trade-offs. Yeah, uh, I guess like the next question is along those same lines. Um, like, what does it take to be a watch? So, what does it take to run a watchtower? Like, will anybody be able to do it? Um, you already mentioned like high reliability, and also like you know you got to be sufficient in, with the code enough. To yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, well, it should be pretty easy to run one. Um, the idea is, well, so the way that's implemented right now is um, there's a standalone watchtower, which um, if you initially will be run like as a, like a side companion to L&D, like it'll be in the same daemon and everything, but it'll be sort of its own like, uh, you know, listening port and sort of like object within there. Um, it should be fairly uh, simple to, and straightforward to basically separate that out into its own binary. So then I'll be able to basically have a separate binary that is just called like watchtower and, you know, listens on a port and has access to the blockchain. Uh, and th then those will be totally isolated too. So if you're running a tower and you already have like, um, you know, a connection to like your RPC service or, you know, your neutrino node running, 
then you could tack it onto the side. But if you also want to separate them somehow, you could um, run it in this isolated process. So it should be pretty minimal. Um, for example, like you can use Neutrino as a backend for this. Um, that will allow you to basically run the chain or like sort of access the chain with minimal state. Um, you all, all you're really using it for is like the header syncing and fetching blocks. Uh, I mean, you should be validating in theory. Um, so like if you want to run a, a hot, like a heavier weight one, like, you know, be fully consistent, uh, you can do that. It's not, I mean, you probably do want to do that because you want to make sure that like the transactions you're seeing are actually on the valid chain. Um, but if you had a neutrino node pointed at like say a, a full node that you also operate or like someone else operates, then, uh, you can get a building security and then your main storage cost is going to be, um, you know, all the state updates. So if you have 330 bytes per state update, um, I can't remember the math, but it's something like, you know, like 30 K per, I don't know. I can do the math later, but yeah, you know, like your, your main, your main space or your main constraint is going to be space. And so, um, you know, at some point you may need to have to like shard that between like multiple instances, um, which actually ends up being pretty easy because in the sort of way, I don't know if you guys are familiar with like, uh, like MapReduce and the way you like shard keys and then have like the shards sort of like reconstruct them. If you just have all the, uh, all the keys that clients input using the hints, those can be sharded out over any number of like lookout services. And then those can independently like query the chain and do all the matching and stuff like that. So, um, well, I don't see that being too much of an issue, but it all, it all depends on like how much space you're willing to commit. Got it. Uh, I know exactly what you're talking about with the shard. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a cryptographer. All right. Uh, the next question is, uh, do you foresee third parties building software wrappers uh, around the breach arbiter? And is Lightning Labs planning to provide a watchtower service? Uh, good questions. Um, so you wouldn't really want to wrap the breach arbiter itself to do a watchtower, for example, um, because the breach arbiter assumes that you have the private keys. Um, so that's one distinction from the watchtower itself. When I, when, I think when we, when we actually started, our initial plan was, okay, we'll just take out the breach arbiter and then use that. And when we got about, uh, you know, not very far and then realized, okay, well, it doesn't have signing keys. So that's going to make it a little more complicated. Um, so, um, yeah, the breach arbiter, if, if your tower has the private keys, then yeah, you should do that. Um, <laughs> but if it doesn't, then you're probably going to need something a little bit different. The other question I think was, uh, is Lightning Labs going to offer a watchtower service? Uh, I think, yeah, for the foreseeable future, we're going to offer a, a service so that, you know, users can connect to us. Um, one of the things that we find really important is for um, the ability to use, specify their own watchtowers and, you know, use one that's not us if they choose to, because um, we don't want to force anyone to, but if people want to, then they can, then uh, we'll be happy enough to like, you know, start their state updates. Awesome. And uh, so like you mentioned how there can be multiple watchtowers, um, who, who gets the reward if you use multiple watchtowers and is it like a winner takes all in a race kind of scenario? Uh, that's correct, yeah. Um, so that question is really dependent on how you set up the sessions. Um, if they all use the same, let's say they all are like the same type, they're either all, or I guess in this case they're all reward. So all of them are reward and all of them use the same fee um then in theory like it's just kind of a tiebreaker whoever like gets it to the mempool first or to a miner first uh if they use different fee rates then you know it's possible that the one with the highest fee rate is the one that's going to win out right um yeah so um but it really depends and then you know if the watchtower is down or they lost your state or they weren't being a good watchtower and they just deleted it you know they're kind of missing out so um yeah you never you never know but uh in general it'll probably be the one with the highest fee rate i'd say yeah, that makes sense. It's uh, whatever a transaction gets into the block first, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so does this process become any more complicated with multi-party channels? Um, yes. Yes, in some sense. Um, but I think most of that is derived from the fact that uh, like multi-party channels with verification are very hard. Um, most, I, I think a lot of the like the better multi-channel approaches we've seen are come from something more like L2, um, where the sort of like combinatorial blow up of revocation and penalties goes away. Um, and in that sense, then maybe not because, uh, well, each of the, each of the parties, I think in theory could, uh, back up sort of their state to towers on their own and fairly efficiently. Uh, I think it's a good also point to discuss like 
uh, a lot of people ask like, uh, well, how will like L2 watchtowers like look, for example? And, you know, in theory, you can make an L2 watchtower that is constant space, um, uh, that basically just sort of backs up the latest state. That does sacrifice some amount of privacy in the sense that if I give a state to the tower and then I want to make sure it's constant space, I have to tell it which one I'm replacing. Um, so there maybe there could be some obfuscation there to like maybe have multiple like copies or something. But in general, it's sort of like uh, it, it induces this like linear history on the state updates that I've sent it. And so it can kind of correlate that like this channel made that state update. Um, if you were a little more privacy conscious, like for example, if, if I was going to back up my tower directly uh, using that system, I think it'd be totally like fine. I'd have no issue with that. If I'm going to trust a like centralized service to like maintain my state updates, I don't know if I want to give them that timing information and that history of the channel. Uh, and in that sense, then you might actually, I think in theory, uh, you can then restore some privacy by using more or less the same protocol we use for revocation based channels, which is just these, or which is the protocol we discussed today, where you, um, you send an update for every uh, revoked state and the tower stores them all. So it can't really deduce that like this is the latest one, these belong to these channels. Um, and so you, in that sense, you can still restore some privacy and the, the current, current protocol can be tweaked with slight modifications to just basically know that it's sweeping an L2 versus like a revoked transaction and more or less works identically. So um, hopefully that answers the question. <laughs> Yeah, uh, this is the last question. Um, I think what he's trying to ask is, uh, well, I'll just ask it. Will the functions of the watchtowers always be necessary in future protocol improvements? And I'm basically, I think what he's trying to ask is like, will there be a future where watchtowers aren't needed? Um, that's a very good question. And I can't say for sure that um, we will or won't, but I think it's pretty likely that we will need something like that. And the primary reason is that uh, when you have off-chain transactions, uh, you know, you do have some sort of history on like uh, from starting from the initial balance all the way to state N and the balances fluctuate. Um, in order to get sort of this valid like signed transaction off-chain, it has to be a valid Bitcoin transaction that could be broadcast. And the chain itself has no idea um, what state you've ever made it to. And it, it can't on its own know that you were, um, that this is a breach or not. And that would, that requires some action uh, by the user to basically correct that on the chain. Uh, that's true of like their current protocol or of, like the current like lightning design. It's true of like L2 channels. Um, there is some action that needs to be taken. Um, maybe not necessarily by any particular party, but you know, to correct, a, to correct a sort of like a state reversion, there's then usually a, like a follow up like reconciliation transaction. So I think for the foreseeable future, that will probably be true. Maybe there's some crazy like zero knowledge snark, um, protocol that'll come out that'll like ob obfuscate that but uh, i think for for this for the foreseeable future yes it'll probably be towers or something like it got it cool um all right well connor thank you so much for your time uh, this was super fascinating <laughs> fascinating i learned a yeah, lot this is really fun thank you for having me <laughs> yeah okay so if you guys could all kind of stay on just for a couple more minutes um i would love to do a quick shout out to our sponsors and so like please stay and listen like without them this could not have happened so um, yeah, let's go. Let's let's hear what they have to say. The first sponsor is Blockstack, and it is a full stack decentralized computing protocol that enables a new generation of applications where developers and users can interact fairly and securely while curing the ills of centralized internet design. Blockstack builds product protocols and developer tools designed to enable a fair and open internet that returns digital rights to developers and consumers. Led by some of the world's foremost experts in distributed systems. Blackstock, Blockstack um, allows other users to own their own data that they can take with them from app to app in the ecosystem. Along with their Blockstack ID that eliminates the need for password-based logins, the end result is privacy, security, and freedom. Solid stuff, Blockstack. All right, the next uh, ad is Voltoro. Um, Voltoro.com is a Bitcoin and physical gold order book exchange where anyone can trade between physical allocated insured and audited gold with Bitcoin. Uh, secured in a top tier vaulting facility in Switzerland within a tax-free zone, Voltoro is the perfect way to hedge Bitcoin's volatility and still be able to sleep at night knowing that your gold is your legal property, fully insured, dealing with LBMA regulated gold. And this has actually been running since early 2015. People have, have used Voltoro.com to trade over $80 million worth of gold and Bitcoin. 
And also, it is the first order book exchange to implement Lightning Network as of May 2018. That's pretty cool. So it makes sense why they're so um, stoked about the Lightning Network and the Voltacon. Uh, make sure to check out Voltoro.com. That's vault, as in a gold vault, and oro, which is um, Spanish for gold, Voltoro. All right, guys, thank you so much for your time. And um, we're going to log off. The next session is at 1 p.m. PDT, and so it's in about 30 minutes. And hopefully, I'll see you guys there. Awesome. Thank you so much, Andrew, and thank you to everyone who, uh, who tuned in today. Uh, hopefully, you got a lot out of that. And, you know, find us on Slack and, and Twitter and if you have any more questions. Thank you. Yeah, where can they, where can they find you if they want to ask you questions? Yeah, uh, well, I'm on Twitter, uh, BitConnor, Connor with an E. Uh, and I'm also on Slack, just Connor uh, in the LND dev community. Um, you'll find me on the LND GitHub and you can find me on IRC sometimes. So, yeah. Solid. All right. See you guys later. Bye. Awesome. See ya.